Thank you, Klaus. And I can tell you from having a, a cam lesion, squatting is not a good idea. It hurts a lot. Anyways. Own experience. Own experience. So I, that's the end of the talk. It's not good. Uh, anyways, thank you very much and always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think we've heard a bit about cam deformity in terms of the uh, pattern anatomy that uh, uh, Professor Gans described and uh, with alpha angles initially described by uh, Hubert Nutzli and defining the gradient of the deformity as well as associate damage. And that a lot of times that can be underestimated uh, uh, if you don't use multiple uh, plane imaging. I think the other thing is uh, we've looked at differential walking and squat motion patterns have been reported with the cam deformity compared to controls as well as higher stresses in the uh, hip socket. And then we've uh, defined from the previous presentation here at the uh, symposium, uh, looking at different anatomical parameters that can provide additional information to differentiate people that are symptomatic versus asymptomatic, looking at uh, femoral neck shaft angle uh, and uh, pelvic uh, motion. What we know from early uh, uh, work from Radin that uh, adverse loaders, uh, load imposes uh, elevated joint stretches that can be predominantly in the subcondral bone and which could play a role in early OA, and that both symptomatic and asymptomatic individual can have elevated uh, subcondral bone uh, stiffness, uh, which most likely relates to adaptation from the cam lesion. And as well as I alluded to, decreased femoral neck shaft angles also play a role in terms of the loading of the hip. So the purpose of this study was to look at the exam, uh, the effects of cam deformity as well as neck shaft angle on established subcondral bone stresses during the squatting test. So we had six male participants, uh, two in each group, uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic, and also we had uh, different uh, head and neck shaft angles in the, two, uh, in the subgroups. And these all had a CT as well as uh, uh, specific squatting uh, exercises, MRI data, and physical examination with a mean age of uh, 32. As I mentioned, they were classified based on the high elevated alpha angle at both at 1 and, and uh, one thirty and 3 o'clock position, as well as having a high or low neck shaft angle, as well as presence or absence of symptoms. They all want a uh, squat test with uh, skin markers that were placed at the time of the CT. So the patient went in for their CT to look at the bone. The uh, skin markers had been placed, and then they were uh, brought to the gate lab immediately so that uh, try to get us best precision possible in terms of reconstruction of the, uh, the, of the hip. Then we uh, looked at muscle forces uh, uh, using force plates and the, obviously the reconstruction with the uh, 3D uh, models. Then the segmentation was done as well as the validation using the various uh, morphological parameters and then using uh, registration CT and MRI to have precise reconstruction of the joint. This was then in, uh, placed into uh, uh, modeling uh, using uh, calibrated phantom as well as bone mapping and modified uh, density elasticity relationship. And obviously this was the uh, PhD that did most of, of all of that work. So what did we find? Uh, so if you look at the low versus the high neck shaft angle, symptomatic versus asymptomatic versus control, as you would expect, the stresses are located in the anterior superior quadrant consistent with the area of damage that we see at the time of surgery. Uh, if you look at where the, uh, most of the, uh, the uh, stresses were applied on the cartilage side, again, the ones with the lower neck shaft angle had the most stresses at uh, 9.3 megapascal. But then if you look at the subchondral bone in that same patient, you can see that the stresses were significantly higher in the subchondral bone compared to the uh, cartilage area in both the symptomatic and asymptomatic side. And this is just a summary of those findings where well, you can look at the impact of both the uh, uh, neck shaft angle as well as symptomatic and asymptomatic, comparing the uh, cartilage versus the bone. And you can see in all those situations, the stresses on the bone are significantly higher than in the cartilage. So what does that mean? Well, when you do these uh, pre-op stresses and the modeling, you can see this is prior to surgical correction. And also these patients had segmentation bone densities done pre and post. And what you can show is that once you've corrected the deformity, you'll see the stresses are relieved significantly, and we've actually uh, been able to alter the bone density on the established side by about 5 to 10 percent significant decrease after surgical correction of the cam deformity, which correlates well with the FEA modeling. So that not only are you able to show the in vivo, but also uh, the uh, uh, modeling of it correlates post-surgical correction. 
So what we've, uh, in discussion, the asymptomatic and symptomatic people show similar stress distribution based on anatomical parameters of the alpha angle and the uh, head and neck shaft angle. There is uh, subchondral uh, remodeling associated with that cartilage uh, loading. And this uh, correlates well with also the uh, different uh, cartilage mapping techniques, either g gemeric or T1-row, in terms of loading of bone and the cartilage. And that correlates as well to the anatomical parameters of alpha angle and the uh, neck shaft angle. And then what the squat it does is really orients that deformity into the anterior superior acetabulum, increasing the uh, stresses in that area and then really putting it in the worst case scenario. So in conclusion, higher stresses on subchondral bone are, are higher than in the acetabular cartilage. The surgery provides clearance of that area and then also leads to a change or altering the actual mechanical loading after a surgical correction potentially uh, uh, possibly altering the natural history of that joint. Thank you very much.